Well, we're delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Vicky Coltman, History of Art, the University of Edinburgh. This illustrated lecture marks the bicentenary of the royal visit of King George IV to Edinburgh in 1822. Drawing on material from her most recent book, Art and Identity in Scotland, a cultural history from the 1745 uprising to Sir Walter Scott, it considers the King's infamous sojourn to the Scottish capital in terms of its preparations, its progress and its aftermath. Particular attention will be given to archival accounts that Vicky identified in the National Records of Scotland's collection and via the National Register of Archives for Scotland. The title of her talk alludes to Waverley, or to 60 years since, Walter Scott's Jacobite novel published in 1814. Scott, as is well known, was the pageant master for the royal visit, which offered a spectacle of reconciliation between the descendants of former Jacobites and their Hanoverian monarch. So over to you, Vicky. Thank you. Thank you so much to Veronica and Joss, and thank you also for coming this evening or for catching up um, if you're watching this on the web. The title of my talk is Geordie or it is 200 years since, because it's obviously this month, August 2022, that we remember the bicentenary of the royal visit to Edinburgh in August 1822. And I want to take this opportunity to look again at the visit with you and particularly to think about the visit in terms of its art historical content. And as you already heard, and as you can see on the screen, I am an art historian. And so what that means is this evening, we're going to be looking at a wonderful range of paintings, engravings, sculpture and objects that are associated with the royal visit. And I'm also very keen to introduce you to some of the collections and repositories where this information is stored. In conjunction with this surfeit of uh, material objects, I want to think a little bit about some of the written accounts that proliferated about and around the royal visit. And I'm today I'm only gonna be looking at accounts that are produced contemporaneously. Um, I've got some newspaper reports, some printed pamphlets, and crucially, I'm going to share with you some manuscripts, particularly in the form of personal correspondence or letters that were written um, by people who were present at the royal visit. And these, particularly this last category of material, the letters, um, were, were, um, were things that I accessed via the National Records of Scotland, and especially via the National Register of Archives for Scotland. And I'm very happy to talk to people in the questions about how you go about accessing these repositories if you're not sure. But I'm starting off really quite deliberately with an image of a rosette. This is a piece of ephemera that survives from the Royal Visit of 1822, now in the Edinburgh Museum on the Royal Mile, that shows uh, St Andrew holding the saltire and surrounded by this lovely wreath of thistles and with a crown over his head saying welcome. And this would have been worn by visitors who came to see George IV during his sojourn uh, to Edinburgh. And so I'm using it here as a means to welcome you to the talk. Before I get onto it, I want to really just establish that the crucial text on the royal visit remains John Preble's The King's Jaunt. Uh, this was published, first published in 1988 and again in 2000. Preble's eminently readable, exhaustive account of the royal visit is still the standard text. So if you're interested, perhaps before my talk or even after it, um, in knowing all the machinations uh, around it, do have try and access that text. And you'll notice that for the edition that I I'm showing you here, David Wilkie's famous um, tartan portrait of the king was used as the dust jacket. And I'm going to talk about Wilkie's portrait later on. 
so we're thinking about Edinburgh and we're thinking about August in 1822, but I think it's useful to establish that there were two royal visits by George IV prior to that to Edinburgh. And in 1821, he visits Dublin. And I'm showing you an image here by William Turner. This is not the great landscape painter, um, J.M.W. Turner, this is an artist who was known as William Turner of Oxford, to differentiate him, who provides this, this image, which I think really sets the tone for some of the images that we're going to look at, where you can see the king um, being transported through the city. And if I can just show you my next screen, where I've got this quote from Freeman's journal. I have long wished to visit you, George IV told uh, his uh, subjects in Dublin. My heart has always been Irish. Now this is, a, this is a rather extraordinary claim, but we're going to learn that there are various claims made around and about the royal visit to Scotland. And I'm showing you a couple of wonderful objects, both from the royal collection on the left, the Order of St. Pat, oh, sorry, on the left, the Shamrock snuff box, and on the right, the Order of St. Patrick. And with the royal visit to Dublin, we have St. Patrick and the Shamrock as fairly prominent part of the repertoire. And when we come to look at the visit to Edinburgh, predictably, we have St. Andrew and the Thistle as the Scottish equivalents. Later on that same year, October 1821, George IV makes another royal visit, and this time to Hanover, where he is reported to have said, I have always been a Hanover, I will live and die a Hanover. He certainly did have Hanoverian blood in his veins, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Uh, George Ludwig, the Elector of Hanover, inherited the British throne in 1714 and became George I. So throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century, the ruling family are the Hanoverians. Right. So let's think about 1822 and think about George IV having visited Dublin, having visited Hanover. He then is going to uh, visit the metropolis of Scotland in Edinburgh. And there's a number of really lively images of his embarkation at Greenwich, of which I'm just showing you one example. George IV obviously travels up to Scotland by sea. He travels to the port of Leith, and at least one scholar has read his uh, maritime journey as being quite deliberate to differentiate from the last member of the royal family who was in Scotland, who was, of course, the Duke of Cumberland, who was leading the government troops against the Hanoverians. I think this is a I think this is an interesting and provocative idea, but we actually know that there was a sort of well-established route between London and Leith in terms of bringing all kinds of commodities up to Scotland. What I'm showing you here is the programme of events uh, from the King's arrival on the 14th of August. He is here for about three weeks and various events involving the great and the good, particularly of Edinburgh and also the Scottish aristocracy are summoned to appear. The day that I really want to focus on in my talk, apologies for the siren, is the 15th of August, the landing uh, of George, his disembarkation, and then the following procession to Holyrood Palace. But do take a note of the different events that comprise the royal visit. There's the court at Holyrood. Notice I've written in brackets, university reps. There's a drawing room where 500 women are introduced to the king, a, a procession to the castle, the military review. It sort of goes on and on and on. And so if you can imagine, this is really like a sort of state visit as we might understand it. Um, and the image I'm showing you on the bottom there is the programme from the 27th of August when a theatrical production of Rob Roy was performed here in Edinburgh, again in Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. And 
in thinking about what I wanted to do today and looking back over my work that I'll tell you about at the end, I sort of thought it would be useful to have sort of three moments in the royal visit. So before, during and after. And before, my before section is this letter from Alexander Gordon to Hugh Irvin. And this was one of the letters that I accessed via the National Register of Archives for Scotland. And as far as I know, at, the, at this point, this correspondence had not been published. And it was really exciting to me to find this letter because Gordon is so pessimistic about the royal visit. So here he is writing on the 23rd of July. So this is kind of three weeks before it's all due to happen. And one of the things we know is that this, this all comes together very, very last minute. And he is really moaning here, uh, as you can see, I've transcribed the text for you, the royal visit will give neither pleasure nor satisfaction to a capital who has not seen its sovereign for 180 years or thereby some notice should have been rendered. Poor Caledonia, I'm slipping, I'm not reading every sentence, I'm slipping through it. Uh, poor Caledonia will make a most shabby figure. And but for the gaping idlers who flock from all quarters to see anything or nothing, I almost presume a general dissatisfaction will be experienced. A couple of comments I want to make about this uh, letter from Gordon, other than this idea that the whole of the royal visit is going to be a disaster, is that he's absolutely right in saying that the capital had not seen its sovereign for such a long period of time. And the last monarch to be in Scotland was Charles II in 1650. And so what we have to think about is how in that extended period between 1650 and 1822, there was no real precedence for how to do a royal visit. So let's remember that in 1707, the Scottish and the English parliaments are united. So certainly there hadn't been a monarch up to Scotland, a reigning monarch up to Scotland. Since then, the only member of the royal family, as I've already said, was the Duke of Cumberland, who the butcher Cumberland, whose reputation we all know about. So there was this issue about, you know, what were they going to do with the king? And how were they, how was this going to unfold? The other point I want to make is he does this lovely, Gordon makes this lovely um, a figurative expression where he talks about the gaping idlers. And as I go through my talk, I'm going to share with you lots of accounts of the royal visit that stress different ideas of how it was viewed and how it was seen. Um, so I hope you will enjoy that. He also has this personification of Scotland as poor Caledonia, we're making a most shabby figure. So let's kind of remember this prognosis as being very negative, uh, in due course. Right, we can now get on to some of the images which I am going to look at in terms of the chronological sequence. Um, there are a series of engravings by the Edinburgh engraver William Home Lazars, which were published in a book by Robert Moody, a historical account of His Majesty's visit to Scotland, which was obviously published the same year that the royal visit took place. And what is quite distinctive about Lazar's engravings is that many of them are on this horizontal axis, by which I mean they tend to be this um, extended rectangular shape. And so we might describe that as sort of panoramic. I'm not suggesting these are a panorama, which is a 360 degree, but these are panoramic. These are sort of the city or parts of the city unfolding. And here, obviously, we're at least as the king disembarks. And this is such a lively representation of uh, this part of Leith. And you can see, I hope, um, that, the, that the properties Lining, uh, lining the area are absolutely crammed with viewers. Notice too, on the, on the right hand side, there are some ship's masts. And again, they are crammed with viewers. And what's typical about a lot of the images by Lazars is that the focus is not so much on the king at the exclusion of 
those who had come to view him. But actually, he tends to be, I mean, he's obviously there and figures within the compositions, but actually what's wonderful is the hordes of people that are shown having come out to meet and greet their king. And this is a view also um, of George IV landing at Leith, which is from the opposite side. So this is where, this is the side where George has disembarked and is being met, as you can see there, by a group of dignitaries who are the kind of great and the good of Leith. Um, and do take a moment to notice this train of figures uh, going off to the left, who are from the company of royal archers. I'm going to show you a quote in due course that talks about their dress. This is such a lovely image, again, a panoramic, a long rectangular uh, image, landscape image, in which is now in Leith Police Station. And I managed to go and see it when they had the September Open Doors Day. And certainly if Leith Police Station is still um, available for that, I would absolutely encourage you to go. There's a great deal of detail uh, in the rendering by Cast, the artist Alexander Cast, in the rendering of some members of the crowd. And there is somewhere a pickpocket, but I can't see him immediately. But one of the ways in which Cast and other artists show the royal visit is that the viewer is invited to feel as if she is there. So as here, we see the backs of some of those who are watching the king. And it's almost as if we are notionally there. I often thought, how on earth was this crowd managed? Um, and then I was very pleased to find in Trinity House, again in Leith, this ticket. And so these, uh, this event was a ticketed event and many of the other events were also ticketed. And since then I found some programs inviting people uh, to various events. So moving on, on that day, this is the day that the King disembarks and having got out of his ship, he then meets his cavalcade at Leith and then they travel all the way up Leith Walk and head towards Picardy Place. And this is another image by Lazars of that, of them coming up towards Picardy Place. And so this is the area where the king is welcomed to the city of Edinburgh. So having traveled through Leith, he is then, we're told, presented with the keys to the city of Edinburgh. And you'll see on the right there, there is what looks like an archway. And that is not a, not a permanent fixture. This is a temporary fixture that is put up for the royal visit. And my comment that I previously made about the sort of swarming mass of people is beautifully illustrated in this colored engraving by Lizars. You can see it's this, it's this fantastic crowd um, uh, swarming to the left and in the front of the image. And also what Lizars does so beautifully is to create portraits of some of the built environment of our city. And you can see there how he does that so carefully. So we can see, we've got the cavalcade, we can see the king, he's in an open carriage, but we can also really see the city of Edinburgh as it unfolds to the king. And there's a lovely letter in the National Records of Scotland from Harriet Scott. And I was very pleased to find this letter because I felt the whole of the rule of visit was, was all to do with kind of men and uh, um, ideas around the military. And so it was lovely to find Harriet Scott writing to her daughter. Um, she lived in your place. And as you see there, she writes to him, we began, writes to her daughter, we began looking and seeing directly after breakfast for the procession assembled in this street to go to meet the king. So again, this idea of the different visual modalities, if I can put it that way, uh, that are at work in the royal visit. So we are now at the top, we've, we're, we're sort of going into, coming into the new town. And here I'm showing you an image by William Turner. This is the same William Turner who painted that lovely image of George IV in Dublin. 
Um, this is in the Museums and Galleries Edinburgh and is not a well-known image and certainly deserves more work. But the image that I want to focus on in a bit of detail is this one. This is by John Wilson Eubank, and this shows the entrance of George IV into Edinburgh, and it was painted that same year. And this is such a fantastic visual representation of what the royal visit was meant to achieve in all its best glory. So what I hope you can see there, and again, as an art historian, we look quite closely at the image. So do, do kind of join me to, um, to look in. What we're dealing with here then is the royal procession who have, and they've come across St Andrew's Square, and they're now going up Waterloo Place and heading towards Holyrood Palace. So I hope you can see that the vantage point that we, the viewer, are standing on is the Carlton Hill. And what this gives us is this lovely elevated view where we're looking right down at the procession. And if you see it, it's almost ant-like in its proportions. It's absolutely tiny and minute. And so what we're seeing is this sweeping curve of the procession. And again, the surface of the Carlton Hill is, is I was gonna say rammed, which, which is really not an academic term, but it's a kind of appropriate. The surface of the Carton Hill is crammed, let's say, with viewers looking down onto what's going on. So what you might say is that this is a history painting because this is commemorating that part of the royal visit when the cavalcade is moving its way through the city. But I also am really so fond of this image because I think it's a bit more than that because it's a cityscape and it's also a portrait of our city. So what are we looking at here? Well, if I can take your gaze to the far back, you'll see these sort of mountainous forms. And what I think Eubank, and I should say this, you don't get this view from Carlton Hill, okay? So if any of you want to head up to Carlton Hill, you will, you will not see this notwithstanding the passing of time. So what Eubank has done is to manipulate the horizontal axis and the vertical axis to give you this view of Edinburgh in terms of almost like it's sort of geological formations. Then on the left, we have this fantastic rendering of the old town, the higgledy piggledy, dark brown, smoky old town. And then almost on the right of the image, we have a view of the new town. And I hope you can see that the new town and going, so it's sort of cutting diagonally through the image like that. I hope, I hope my cursor is visible to you. You can see that we have this image of the new town bathed in this golden light. And one possible way of reading this light is that light becomes a kind of metaphor for enlightenment and the intellectual progressions that we witnessed in Edinburgh um, from the late 18th century. Um, I mean, I certainly think that's, a, that's an interesting view. For me, it's also about Edinburgh as a modern city and as a city that is taking its place within a, within a kind of massively expanded British empire. This canvas is in the city art collection. Um, belonging to, to Edinburgh, and is, as I say, I think probably, the, for me, is the most important rendering of uh, the royal visit. The final image from that day, the 15th of August, is this one, David Wilkie, the entrance of George IV at Holyrood House. So notice how I'm, I'm trying to show you these images in the order in which they happen. So we've got the embarkation, then we're at the top of Leith Walk and Pitty Place, and then we're at the foot of the Carlton Hill. So the, the cavalcade is basically making its way towards Holyrood, and this is the final of the images by David Wilkie, who is, of course, Scottish-born. He's from Fife, but Wilkie is really a metropolitan painter and has a practice in London. We also know that he comes up here to Edinburgh for the duration of the royal um, visit. And he brings with him, or he is accompanied by other London-based artists. And there's wonderful surviving correspondence 
from members of George IV's court to ensure that these artists are given prime seats so they can see what's going on, so they can sketch it as it all unfolds, with the hope being that they're going to work it up. This is a canvas that Wilkie produces. It's finished in 1830 and it's exhibited at the Royal Academy in London in 1830. And I have to say, it is not well received. Um, Wilkie is made King's painter in 1823. And he, he has to have this, this onerous royal appointment of which this is one of the images that he produces. There's a lot to say about this image, but because I'm conscious of the time, I'll just say that the kneeling figure in front of the king is the Duke of Hamilton. And he is kneeling to him to offer him the keys for Holyrood Palace. So he is basically symbolically handing over the ancient palace of the kings of Scotland to George the Fourth, um, and yes, as I said, this is a this is trying to be a celebratory canvas, but is not entirely successful. Right. So that was this that was this bumper day, if you like, where um, George the Fourth makes his way to Holyrood Palace. I should say at this point, of course, he doesn't stay at Holyrood because the palace is not. Fit. He actually stays at Dalkeith Palace, um, although some, a modest number of events take place at Holyrood. These are a couple of images from later in his sojourn, just to share them with you. Again, they're these hand coloured engravings, which are so attractive, by Lazars from the Robert Moody text. And up top, we obviously have, this is the day when there was a procession to the castle and the king stands on the castle battery and looks across um, at the city of Edinburgh. On the bottom right, we've got an image of the banquet. And this was held in the great hall at Parliament House and was hosted by the city of Edinburgh. And it's just worth saying that both these, I put these images together because I've talked quite a lot about the panoramic view as a sort of horizontal um, uh, shape. And here we have these vertical views or, or what's sometimes known as a vista. So if you can imagine, we're looking at that um, great hall and the king is at the furthest end from us, the viewer, but we can see him much more closely here in this image by JMW Turner. So this is by the great Turner, if we want to call him that. And this is one of a number of preliminary works that he made during the royal visit. So obviously what we're having here is we had that vista uh, from Lizars, and then here we have Turner presenting us with a detail. And I expect that this corner of the Great Hall is where he had been given his privileged seat so that he could see everything that was going on. I want to show you now Turner's sketchbook. This is in the Tate. And again, we know that, so obviously Turner is here for the royal visit. And we know that he certainly contemplates working up some of the scenes that he'd witnessed. And what we can see from this sketchbook is that it's obvious that Turner didn't think of the royal visit as a series of unconnected episodes, but he thought of it sort of in terms of a whole, and he was going to produce a kind of scheme of paintings. Now I apologize because I realized these is a this sketchbook, the images are in pencil and they're very, very difficult to see. But I hope you can just about make out these very small squares, which are numbered from right to left to one to four, and then go across the sketchbook and then come back down from 11 and then go from left to right. So what we can really see here is that he was considering this sequence of paintings uh, to, 
somehow represent the royal visit. And then there's this lovely pencil sketch of a tartan bonnet, tartan red, he's annotated it, uh, just for his own notes. And so while we didn't have, well, well Turner never worked this up, uh, we certainly do have other images that are worth thinking about. And this group of four images was completely unknown to me before I started to put the PowerPoint together. And they're in the National Galleries of Scotland and they are pen and wash drawings by Sir John James Stewart. And again, I put these in to show you how the different episodes of the royal visit were represented. So obviously there we've got the landing, the procession to Holyrood, sorry, the landing, the procession, the arrival at Holyrood, bottom left. And, on the, and then on the right, we've got the procession to the castle. And notice on the right, that the page is of a vertical orientation where we get this lovely sense of um, the old town and its, uh, and its built structures. Right, how am I doing for time? I'm okay. Um, Veronica said in the, in the introductory text that Scott stage managed the royal visit. And this is something that could be a talk on its own terms. What exactly does that mean? Well, one of the things that Scott does is before the King comes to Edinburgh, he publishes anonymously this pamphlet entitled Hints Addressed to the Inhabitants of Edinburgh and Others in Prospect of His Majesty's Visit by an old citizen. And the old citizen is him referring to himself. And for me, one of the most striking sentences in that whole pamphlet is this one. We are the clan and our king is the chief. And one of the reasons behind the royal visit was really to move beyond the, particularly the 45 Jacobite uprising, and to recognize that Scotland and England were reconciled um, after these bloody years of, you know, what was what some scholars would suggest was a civil war, but other scholars would say was a storm in a teacup. This is not something I want to get into today. What I want to, you to think about is this idea of all of Scotland being imagined by Sir Walter Scott as Highland in the sense of being one clan ruled over by the chief George IV. And it's now time for me to look at some of the other images that were produced in response to the royal visit, in which we can see George IV as head to toe in Tartan, where he becomes a version of a clan chief. And this is the one that I want to start with, um, which is called, as anonymous, the first laird in all Scotia or of you at Edinburgh in August 1822. This is a, a genre of visual representation which is called graphic satire and all the satires that I'm going to look at I think there's two were produced in London so this is very much a metropolitan English comment on the royal visit and predictably uh, what they comment on is uh, George IV's attempts to fashion himself as some kind of clan chief I'm going to talk about this one very quickly, but as you can see, the subtitle is A View at Edinburgh in August 1822. Now, ostensibly, the view that is being indicated by George's outstretched hand is that of the castle. But of course, the actual view that the image is referring to is that of the spectators who are positioned below George IV and his companions, and who have an uninterrupted view up what is supposed to be his kilt, but looks nothing like Highland dress. And so the inference being that they are having this unexpurgated view of George IV's private parts. You'll notice a man there is uh, trying to shield the uh, eyes of his female companion, and a lot of the women are, are looking away or have gone bright red. Another graphic satire of the royal visit is this one, Geordie and Willie keeping it up, Johnny Bull pays the piper. And this is where I got 
my uh, title from, this is where I got Geordie, was from this image. And again, this is another comment on the royal visit from England, because Johnny Bull Peng the Piper refers to John Bull, the um, personification of England, who is said to be Peng the Piper. What this is saying is that it's England who is picking up the check for the royal visit. And obviously we do have a Piper in this image on the far left who is shown emaciated. He is almost as thin as uh, the pipes of his bagpipes. And this was this way of representing Scots was really common from probably from the later decades of the 18th century to show them as impoverished and um, emaciated in part because of their diet. And you'll see the bowl uh, on the floor there is inscribed royal porridge. The figure on the right is George IV, who is shown kissing uh, one of the society women who were presented to him. And this is, this is a, I mean, this is a deeply offensive and unpleasant image on many, many fronts. Um, the Scottish women are supposed to be shown as all sorts of unattractive shapes and sizes. The figure with George IV dancing a jig is Sir William Curtis. And he is the former Lord Mayor of London who actually came up to Scotland with George IV and who accompanied him as his sort of partner in crime during the royal visit. And he is much lampooned in the other satires. Right, so just to give you a sense of the progress from a letter of the 23rd of August, 1822. And in contrast with that rather pessimistic letter that I've already shown you, this is really upbeat. His Majesty is delighted with Scotland, writes G.L. Meeson. And he talks about the royal visit to 1822 as being sort of carnivalesque like you have in the Italian cities. And he also talks later on about country people who've come to the city, who've saved their pittance to get a peep at royalty and turn back delighted at the little they see. So certainly this is an account of the royal visit that is manifestly positive. Right, then I'm going to start thinking as I wrap up about the aftermath of the royal visit in art historical terms. It's often been said that Henry Rayburn, Edinburgh's greatest portrait painter, was going to paint George IV's portrait. And I finally found evidence of this in this printed farewell address, a piece of printed ephemera. I don't know if you can read it, but right on the bottom, it says um, that. Um, Rayburn is going to paint the king in Highland dress. And it was a fantastic find via the NRAS to discover this letter from Rayburn dated during the royal visit when he wrote to the Lord Chief Commissioner, William Adam, effectively putting himself forward for that task. This, is a, this has uh, never been uh, published before, uh, I was working on it. And this is the kind of find, when you find artist letters um, that have never been published, it's a real coup. And I think this adds, this adds so much to that story of how Rayburn was going to paint the king because Rayburn we can see here was actively pursuing the commission. Of course, Rayburn never did paint the king because he dies in 1823 and the, Wilkie then becomes the king's painter to Scotland and we see the portrait that Wilkie produced here signed and dated 1829 so again this was a commission that took many many years to unfold and this I mean Wilkie is not Wilkie is not a great portrait painter but certainly one of the things that he does capture here is how Highland dress is much more than textile. And he shows all the accoutrements that the king commissioned for this full suite of Highland dress. I just show you a detail of some of them there. And 
the uh, Holyrood Palace here in Edinburgh have a lovely display of the accoutrements. They don't, I don't think we any have the Highland, uh, the Highland dress anymore, but we certainly have all the accoutrements and they're brilliantly displayed. So what else in terms of the aftermath? Well, another letter that I found was this one from the contemporary sculptor Richard Westmacott, where, so he tells us that it was already planned that there was going to be um, what he calls in this letter, a compliment is intended to his majesty for Edinburgh, by which we understand that following the royal visit, it was intended to erect a sculpture in memory and in commemoration of that royal visit. And what Richard Westmacott is doing, Westmacott is not really, is not a hugely well-known sculptor, but what's great is that, again, he's petitioning William Adam and saying, you know, can you think about me for this commission? Because Westmacott is not known in Scotland at this time, but he is someone who works in bronze. What I really enjoy about this letter is that it was obviously ignored because what the Edinburgh establishment did was to go to Francis Chantry, who is the kind of go-to English sculptor for the Edinburgh establishment. And he produces, of course, this bronze sculpture of George IV, which stands at the junction of Hanover Street and George Street. Um, and that is the sculpture that really is the lasting commemoration to the royal visit. And it was originally, there was originally talk that it might have been an equestrian statue, which means that George would have been on horseback, but in the end, it was what we call a pedestrian statue. Right. There were many much more modest forms of objects that commemorated the royal visit. And here I've just put in uh, some examples I found on the Royal Collection web website. Um, a ceramic plate, a citrine, which actually is inscribed in commemoration of the Royal Visit to Scotland, 1822, and then again, a medal. And what I'm showing you there is the obverse and the reverse of the medal so that you can see both of them. So there certainly was this lasting material legacy through the life-sized uh, pedestrian bronze and then through these, through other forms of material culture. That is where I have to leave it for today. I'm conscious of the time and I'm probably running over, but I have been using material for this talk that I published in my most recent book, which is called Art and Identity in Scotland. It has a whole chapter on the monarch in the metropolis and thinks about the visit of George IV to Edinburgh. It talks about some of, I mean, the book talks about some of the things I've talked to you about today, but I've also really tried to add things that weren't in the book um, in the hope that, you know, you might, that, that it might just sort of enrich the topic even more. So um, I think that's all I want to say on this for now, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Vicky, for such a fascinating talk. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, it's here that we're going to end the recording.